This is NDTV. And you're watching Classics. He was in big trouble, really, till the Second World War. But once the war started, they had no choice but to allow all industry to, to, to grow, no matter who was there, who owned it, because they needed the goods. And that's really what allowed him to come out of the hole he was in at that particular stage. But really what happened was that each time any UK company, any British company couldn't run an industry, they put it on the market. So that's how father went into sugar, and that's how he went into paper, Shri Gopal, and that's how he went into insurance for that matter, etc. Well, you know. I just remember him being dashingly handsome, a man with a violent temper, but a person we loved in spite of everything. If he ever did come back with business worries, we weren't aware of anything. We were never involved in any of that, because they said we all dispersed the minute he came home, we were petrified, we stayed in our rooms, we didn't step out. He wouldn't see anything, but it was enough that we didn't want to confront him, that was all. One look used to be enough, say if it'd be naughty or anything, I mean one look was enough to make us cower. I have only anecdotal evidence to tell me about the kind of person he was and the way he managed his business. But it is very clear that he was in business for the love of being an entrepreneur and being in business. And, uh, and I think that that should be, has to be a driving force, you know, making money, creating wealth, these are also there. But I mean, it, it, what I gathered always about him was that he, he enjoyed the challenge of, of business and he enjoyed the challenge of bringing people together and, and grooming them and letting them go out and, and run those businesses. My grandfather was the kind of person who, when he entered a room, conversation stopped. He was very awe-inspiring. He was a tremendous personality, but very basic and very down-to-earth at the same time. There was no la di da about him. He was very fundamental. Um, he was, what should I say? Very, as I said, down-to-earth, I think, but um, so um, for all that, he built up an empire. He was confident enough to leave it to his kids during his lifetime. He did his own succession plan during his lifetime and uh, was very confident that if anything ever went wrong, he would always be able to set it right. When we talk about the men who laid the building blocks of Indian industry, who built India Incorporated, the name Karamchand Thapar is right up there at the top of the list. This week we tell you the story of this young man from Ludhiana who went off into the wilds of the coal fields of Bihar and went on to build an empire that survives to this day. Karamchand Thapar was born in Ludhiana and spent his growing years in small town Punjab. By the time he went to college in Lahore, it was clear that academics was not his area of excellence. He joined an uncle's hosiery business. This was not a job that lasted long, and soon Karamchand was forced to abandon a young family in Punjab to seek his fortune in the coal belts of Bihar and Bengal. I'm not clear about the first part, but I believe he was in the hosiery business in uh, Ludhiana. We are all Sindhana Punjabi family. 
But he tweaked on quite fast, so there's not much future to, uh, to, to flogging uh, hosiery goods, whatever they might be. And uh, he knew a person called Sardar Ladda Singh Bedi, who was in the coal business. So I think father joined hands with him right in the beginning, etc. And they were coal contractors. In other words, oh. first coal, then sugar, then paper, then insurance, then banking. He bought a bank in the end. OBC, Oriental Bank of Commerce. He was, in his essence, he was an entrepreneur and a builder. You know, I mean, his entire life, from what I know, he built. Uh, you know, he, he created wealth, he created opportunity, he built people, he built businesses, he diversified, he took risk, he did everything an entrepreneur should be doing, all right? And he gave back, you know, through whether it's through the Thapar Institute in Patiala or through other ways, he gave back. And uh, in a time in which the country was, uh, was transitioning, all right, and we are still transitioning, maybe a different sort of transition today, I think he's a very important uh, part of that firmament, yeah. How did it get manifested? And he'd go to office at a fixed hour, etc. He'd come downstairs in a particular uniform, etc. He'd have a, and he had breakfast, etc. Then he'd put his sapa on, and he'd put his suit on, etc. He'd go to office at a fixed hour. He'd come back at a fixed time. No personal indulgences and no, no pleasures, no. Yes. Never smoked, never drank. Till this corrupts son of his came back from the States, etc., who drank and smoked, etc. So when he'd have British uh, guests over or whatnot, he'd tell me, Kaka, do you have a cigarette feeling? <laughs> <laughs> Was it you coming back in the middle of the riots in Calcutta? Yeah. We reached Calcutta Airport. It wasn't just sold at the airport, just a handful of people. In the meantime, my father rang up. And he said, look, you're not to leave the airport. I will let you know what to do. But half an hour later, he rang up to say, look, Sodova, the son is coming to fetch you. And you only leave the airport with him. Five minutes later, he rang up again. He said, under no circumstances are you to leave with him. And by then, we knew this was a Hindu-Muslim rights were on. And we had to go through Siala, which was the heart of the Muslim community. At about 5.30 in the evening, we saw a bus rolling in. We just swords, kirpans, coming out of the windows, and people with rifles. So we were wondering, and we thought maybe people have come to raid the airport or something, and out stepped my father. I only knew the seriousness of the situation when he turned on and said, look, if anything happens, I will shoot you. Are you prepared for it? I said, yeah. 